Yes. I'm gonna, we're ready to go. We're live on. Sure, we're fine. We have fewer speakers than anticipated, but timing, we're okay. But and I'll, we'll speak in about 30 seconds. Perfect, good to know. Yes? This is wrong. No. This is not us. Sorry, sorry. Yep. There you, are. you may have heard of. Uh, it's uh, relatively famous in the energy world. We've been producing a World Energy Outlook since 1998, full of the IEA's uh, objective analysis data and, and projections. Uh, today we're going to showcase the latest World Energy Outlook 2021, which picks up all the themes that we've been highlighting over the last few months. The, the, the recovery from, from COVID, uh, the um, announced pledges and our trends and, and where we're going in terms of reaching net zero. But to give you all of that, I pass directly over to our executive director, Dr. Fatih Birol, to take you through the, the highlights of the World Energy Outlook. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom, and good morning, uh, dear colleagues. A very good morning to all of you. Uh, I would like to start the day with a very, very good news. At least I believe it's a good news. Uh, in the last few days, we heard several pledges, commitments from countries in terms of their net zero emissions by 2050. Some of them are a bit... Uh, longer time horizon and we also heard that uh, more than 100 countries had pledges to reduce their methane emissions including uh, Colombia uh, uh, which is represented by uh, Mr. Minister uh, here. So yesterday night I asked my colleagues one of them is here, uh, Christoph McGlade, my clever colleagues, to run our models once again. What would it mean if all the pledges announced uh, as of yesterday night were to be implemented? Where are we in terms of temperature increase? And the result is extremely encouraging. If all the pledges on carbon neutrality and the methane pledges were to be fully implemented, we will have a temperature increase trajectory which is 1.8 degrees Celsius. This is excellent. I would like to congratulate all of those countries and the uh, people who most made those countries, made those sta uh, statements and commitments uh, wholeheartedly. This is excellent. Now, from this point, I want to say one thing on the International Energy Agency. We were also very happy that the co-presidency asked the International Energy Agency to track those pledges to be the gendarmerie, if, if I may say so in French, of the energy world. Who said what, but who does what to compare that and make it public around the world and provide policy advice to those countries who are not doing their jobs uh, in line with their promises. 
So this is a, this will be our new job as of uh, next uh, year, and I am very uh, very happy uh, with that. Now, coming back to virtual geology, as my colleague uh, Tom House, who is the head of our environmental division, uh, uh, said, there are many important messages coming from the world's flagship publication. I would like to, uh, Tom, if you agree, I would like to pick up uh, two issues, and I am sure the, uh, the colleagues after me are going to make more comments. One of them is, for me, the, perhaps the most important, just one liner, a new global energy economy is emerging. It is emerging, the data is there. I am a man who makes his hands dirty with data every single day, and I can assure you that a new global energy economy is emerging. Solar, wind, electric cars, efficiency, other technologies, they are mushrooming everywhere. And they are not only driven by the climate concerns, they are dri driven by the economic uh, uh, drivers, technological advancements, and they are going very strongly. So this is a, a very important, uh, in my view, trend that everybody needs to take uh, note of. Energy companies, investors, governments, citizens, this is a real fact, this is number one. Number two, in fact, in line with this, we are seeing that the, some of the clean energy technology industries are getting really big guys. The five manufacturers, solar panel manufacturers, windmills, batteries, fuel cells, Electrolyzers, if you put all of them together, manufacture the market size of these industries, they are very soon be as big as the oil industry today, which is today oil industry, as we all know, one of the backbones of the uh, uh, global financial system. So why I'm saying this, it is important to note that the, there are technologies which are going to create jobs, which are going to create opportunities. And I can tell you that one of the drivers of the clean energy transition will be the competition among the countries to take a part in the next chapter of the clean energy industry. Of course, it is very good that it also helps the climate change uh, uh, case, it helps the air pollution, it helps the energy security, but the driver here in many cases is the countries want to position their economies in the next chapter of the clean energy industry. This is something we are seeing and the, uh, the amount of the market size of these five manufacturers will be soon about one trillion US dollar with creating a lot of jobs uh, around the world. So Tom, I wanted to uh, stop uh, here, highlighting these two messages coming from uh, the, uh, our World Energy Outlook. And uh, I wanted to perhaps take this opportunity to thank the uh, 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 Minister Mesa from uh, Colombia, A, uh, uh, being with us for being with us here today, but maybe more importantly, what he has been doing, an incredible work from an energy producing country, how he is, together with his president, of course, transforming uh, his uh, country and being, making it one of the pioneers of the clean energy transition in Latin America, being an energy uh, 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 producing country. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Minister. So uh, may I now ask you, Mr. Minister, to say a few uh, words uh, on uh, the World Energy Outlook. Thank you very much, thank you. Well, thank, thank you very much, uh, Fatih, uh, for this invitation and congratulations to you and your team uh, on the release of this World Energy Outlook 2021. Uh, I'll, I'll say a few words before about the Energy Outlook because I think it's a very good document for all countries and uh, to highlight that this has been done as a guidebook for COP26. 
Uh, and I think um, for Colombia it's been very relevant. We've uh, used the outlook to try to understand and identify what are the opportunities and the challenges for our own commitments. And I think the key message here is uh, with what we have in this uh, very important document, uh, we can commit to maintain that promise of the 1.5 degrees Celsius alive. And I think it, the commitments that we've seen that you just mentioned and you know, the, with the results from the modeling are very encouraging. So uh, just want to highlight the four main takeaways that, I, you know, that I'm taking from the, from the World Economic Outlook uh, in order to reach that. And I think one uh, aspect that Fatih mentioned is absolutely critical and is that this is not only uh, a must in order to be able to continue to fight climate change, but it's also an economic opportunity. And I think, uh, you know, uh, when, those two, when those two uh, the things uh, converge, then I'm sure we're gonna have very positive results. So the first one is to do a massive additional push uh, on clean electrification. And that's absolutely key. And what we've seen is that uh, we need to, you know, continue to expand variable renewable energy, going to new sources of uh, renewable energy, such as green hydrogen, uh, geothermal, uh, offshore wind. And uh, there's uh, an opportunity there. And according to uh, the wheel, what we're seeing is that the potential and in investment in wind and solar is about 1.2 trillion uh, US dollars uh, from here until 2050. So that's key. Second uh, would be to um, accelerate the decarbonization of the economy. Um, and here we have uh, one of the most important levers uh, to achieve this goal. We could have about one third uh, combining the diversification and decarbonization efforts uh, of the uh, gold that we are seeking as, 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 as the world. I would also like to mention uh, what the outlook says about energy efficiency and behavioral changes. I think that's also key. Uh, it, could be, it could add up to 15% or so uh, of the target that we're uh, looking at. And this obviously is a conscious decision, not only by uh, end consumers, but companies as well. Uh, there's a third point that I think is key, and you, know, you, you spoke about oil and gas, and we've seen here in, in Glasgow a very big push to reduce methane emissions, which is the, the second uh, largest source of uh, global greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and we saw, for example, a very good commitment yesterday by Canada, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, uh, committing to reduce 75% of methane emissions by 2030. Uh, we're doing the same, something very similar in Colombia uh, that we've shared with uh, our colleagues. And finally, obviously we need to invest more in innovation, and I think that's key, and we can unlock the potential. So Fatih asked me, you know, what have we been doing in Colombia in uh, all these different fronts? And uh, I'll just start by saying that Colombia is not a big emitter. We're responsible only for 0.6% of uh, global emissions, but regardless of that, uh, we have very, very ambitious commitments uh, for our country. So we've agreed to increase our commitment from Paris. Uh, originally, our commitment was to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 20% to 2030. But our president announced last December, and we confirmed that here in Glasgow, we're going to 51% reduction by 2030. And more, more important than that, uh, when he was here on Tuesday, he announced that we now have an, a strategy for 2050. It was called the E2050 strategy for Colombia and is the roadmap to achieve carbon neutrality for the country by 2050. And we've done the same from the sector. So energy, mining, and the power sector, we presented as well our roadmap uh, to uh, get to carbon neutrality by 2050. And most of the actions for our sector are aligned with what we see from the world energy outlook. The first one is diversification, so continue to uh, expand uh, the incorporation of variable renewable energies. In Colombia, only three years ago, uh, variable renewable energy only made up 0.2% of our power matrix. We've done auctions, we created a, a policy framework that's very attractive with fiscal incentives, and now we've multiplied that by 100 times uh, in just three years and the pipeline will continue to grow exponentially. We've also included significant incentives for energy efficiency. 
uh, we talk about methane reductions. I announced yesterday we'll be uh, regulating the reduction uh, of methane emissions in the oil and gas sector with a new resolution that is being published this month. Uh, and we expect to have a very good target. We need to quantify that's something that we're working on uh, in Colombia because that's one uh, another point that I wanted to make about the world economic outlook, uh, world energy outlook, sorry, and is that it gave us, uh, you know, quantitative data to be able to track all these pledges and commitments and actually put numbers into what the countries are committing to. And finally, I would like to say that on the mitigation and innovation, we're also uh, doing very important work. Uh, we announced as well that Colombia will be reaching the 30 by 30 uh, pledge, which means having 30% of the total land area protected by 2030. We'll reach that goal in 2022, uh, which is uh, significant. And finally, in electrification, we're doing uh, significant effort to also increase uh, sustainable mobility. So Colombia created a framework in 2019 uh, to encourage people to move to other cleaner sources uh, for mobility. And today we are the leading country in electric vehicle sales in Latin America. And this year we're gonna have a growth rate of three digits. I was just looking at the numbers for October, a uh, growth rate of about 250%. And again, exponential growth is expected to continue uh, in, the, in the next uh, several years. So. My message is uh, we're in this together, regardless of the size of the country, regardless of you know, uh, what uh, responsibility that we have for global emissions. As you, I said, Colombia uh, is you know, only responsible for 0.6%, but we're fully committed with 2050 carbon neutrality and you know, following the path that we see. And this has been a great tool for us to develop our policy. Thank you very much. Diego, thank you very much uh, for this excellent uh, um, illustration of what your country did and what World Energy Outlook uh, says. Once again, dear colleagues, this is many countries are uh, moving in the direction of clean energy transition, but Colombia, especially being an uh, energy producing country, I have here Felipe also uh, with us, the CEO of uh, uh, the uh, eco the uh, eco petrol this is the uh, the uh, very very important oil company in uh, the, perhaps the most important oil company in Colombia the most important uh, oil company uh, Colombia Felipe Bayon many colleagues are uh, witnessing the big change in Colombia and I would like to once again thank you very much Diego for your leadership together with your uh, president you um, sometimes uh, a confused world energy outlook and world economic outlook. The reason is a good one because before being a, a minister having such an important post, uh, Diego uh, had a very important job in IMF. In, in as you know, IMF is a world energy outlook, also WEO. But uh, very many thanks, uh, uh, Diego, for coming here. With this, uh, uh, Tom, I would like to give the floor to you, but telling everybody that. This report this year, we published uh, one month earlier than our normal uh, schedule to provide uh, uh, input for this uh, meeting. And I am very happy to see that our numbers are all uh, uh, across the uh, COP26 and delegations. We are very happy that uh, we were able to make a, a modest contribution to uh, this hopefully very good outcome uh, from uh, Glasgow. As I wrote today in my uh, uh, note in my uh, tweet, with this 1.8 degrees being in uh, sight, I believe uh, where we are, our headquarters, Paris, Paris and Glasgow are now getting uh, closer and closer. I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fatih. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. So there you have it. You had this morning's headlines. Uh, the 1.8 degrees, the improved pledges. It would be great if we can keep this rate of progress up. And you also got the, 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 one of the key messages from, from the World Energy Outlook, which is the, the fact that the, new, the energy transition is creating a new energy economy uh, worth billions, creating jobs around the world. And we also heard, uh, thanks to the minister, of the role that analysis like this can play in helping countries work out what they need to do, however big or however small their emissions, 
uh, work out what they need to do to do decarbonize and to take advantage of the clean energy transition. So now to, to dive into a bit of the detail of the World Energy Outlook, I'd happily call on my, ah, no, we, uh, if, uh, if I may be so bold as to invite Lord Deben up onto the stage to give us the view of uh, the UK's uh, Climate Change Committee Chair. Uh, welcome. Thank you. And uh, if, if you can catch your breath, we'll, uh, yes, <laughs> we'll happily give you the floor to give a few words on uh, your take on, on the World Energy Outlook. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I apologize for not being here on time, but uh, I must say, uh, I, I'm, um, I'm a believer that there are two words that we ought to keep in our minds right from the beginning. One is optimism, because otherwise we won't get anywhere. And the other is apocalypse, because that's what will happen if we don't get it right. And those two we have to hold together in our minds. Um, and uh, energy, of course, is absolutely a center of that. And the Climate Change Committee in Britain has been pressing the government to take the sort of steps you have to take uh, if you're going to solve these problems. And I suppose for us, the real triumph was when the government announced that there would be no more fossil fuels used for generation after 2035, which is what we asked for and what they have now committed and have committed in such a way as it is part of the law because we have a system in Britain whereby when we propose our budgets, that is put before Parliament and once Parliament has passed that, then it becomes law and it can't be changed without our permission. The Climate Change Committee, which is nine of us, all other eight are, uh, are experts in the sense of being uh, internationally known scientists or economists. I'm the one who's supposed to hold them all together and, and use language which we can all understand. So as far as Britain is concerned, I think we are taking the steps that need to be taken in terms of our aims. And now with the net zero strategy and the buildings and heat strategy, we've gone the next step, which is the mechanisms by which we intend to do it. The problem is, like with every government, is actually doing it. And my job is to keep those feet to the fire to make sure that we actually do it. And also to be very direct about what you can't do. So there are two big issues which we've got at this moment. Um, and it shows how institutionally change is absolutely essential. We, we haven't yet got the institutional and uh, uh, systemic change that we need to have if we're going to meet the world energy needs. And the two of the bits that I will give you an example. First of all, the systemic change. We've got a huge program of offshore wind. Offshore wind and onshore wind are now the cheapest way we produce um, generation. Uh, we've got uh, a huge program um, over the next uh, 20 years, but we still don't know how to connect it from offshore onto onshore because we're still using technical um, and uh, legal arrangements which were designed for a competitive circumstance 20 years ago. And so it's a sort of, I, we'd say, it's a dad's army kind of mechanism. It really doesn't work. And we are terribly slow in getting those changes to have a proper ring main to link things into it, do all those things. So that's number one. And also, getting politicians to recognize the difference between the electricity system that we are going to have and the one we have had is very difficult. I mean, uh, I like the French word for a generating station, centrale, because centrale sums up the old system. You had central generation and you shoved it out. Now we have dispersed generation, we shove it in. It's a different system. And, and I think politicians fiddle at the edges rather than accept that you've really got to get that right. So that's one area of it. The other area is what do you do about what the IEA so sensibly has said about that which is still in the ground? And we have two big issues about this. The first is that there is a proposal, not unsurprisingly from an Australian group, to dig a coal mine off the coast of Cumbria, one of the poorest and most backward uh, in terms of uh, uh, most deprived areas of, uh, of Britain. Um, and they are saying, of course, the reason they want to do that is because we then won't have to import that coal, which is for steel, in from uh, the rest of the world, particularly America. Now, what they don't tell you is that they're only going to use 20% of it in Britain anyway. 
And what's more, now we're not going to be allowing it to be used after 2035. Having a planning permission until 2045 is actually a lie. I mean, you, you are offering them something which you're not going to ena enable them to do. Um, and so uh, we then discover, of course, that we have a planning system which has not been rewritten for uh, net zero and for our agreements under... Uh, 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 under the um, uh, Paris Agreement. So you then have to look at the whole of that. The government's now producing a new planning act and that work is going on. In the meantime, there is uh, an investigation into this and the minister responsible, in this case Michael Gove, is going to have to make a decision, a quasi-judicial decision within the legal framework that we've got at the moment. And the Climate Change Committee has said very clearly, you cannot have the coal mine. It just is not acceptable. And uh, we therefore have been pressing for that, but there is a legal process through which it has to go. The same is true of the extra um, wells that people want to uh, put off the coast of Scotland. But as you've already discovered, all of you here being in Scotland, Scotland is a separate country and it has its own laws and regulations. It has its own Climate Change Act. We advise them quite separately from advising the, the rest of the government. And they have to reach net zero by 2045, five years ahead of the United Kingdom as a whole. That makes up for the north of Ireland, which can't do it by 2050 for its uh, very, very basic um, agricultural problems that it has. So uh, here we are with two governments involved in it, finally it will be a United Kingdom government decision. And I've made it absolutely clear that there has to be some very, very, very remarkable explanation as to why any of those should go ahead. I put it like that because there are, as always are, there are legal difficulties because there are contracts about what has already been agreed. And I don't know, and none of us know at the moment, whether those are going to be able to be enforced, and therefore that's an issue which will have to be taken. But in general, we have taken the view that there really is no place for new sources of energy, unless you could really prove that something else would close down because you were doing that. It's, it, everything else will be additional. So I end simply by saying this. Uh, I think we're in a good place, but we're only in a good place as long as we keep on going at it. Um, and it is the question of pushing people all the time, keeping people's feet to the ground, and also explaining that it, you can't have two different policies in one government. But I don't know a government in all my life. I was a minister for 16 years. I never knew a government that didn't have at least two different policies contracting each other. It's one of the difficulties of government. So it's, it's, they've got to learn new ways when it comes to climate change uh, as well as energy. Well, I have got the end of my <laughs> actual um, <laughs> ability to speak for a moment, but I'm happy to answer any questions anybody wants. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Thank you very much indeed, Lord Devon. You can take a seat down here. So there you are. We've, we had earlier headlines of the new energy economy and, and just now a, a story of implementation, of the imp uh, implications of the findings of the World Energy Outlook, uh, the implementation of this in in, uh, in the UK, uh, in particular with the, the, the story of the messaging from the World Energy Outlook this year of the, the absence of the need for new development of, of fossil fuel resources and, and a, a classic case study of, of what, that, what that means on the ground. So to dive into a bit more detail on, on all of this, I would now ask my colleague uh, Christoph McGlay to, to, to come up to, uh, to help uh, deal with the difficult questions that are far beyond me. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, for all of the questions you, uh, you, you have on, on the World Energy Outlook, we've, we've had some already, but if there are questions from the floor, we're happy to take questions, please. Any questions from the floor? If not, then perhaps I'll turn to some of the questions we've earlier received, which include uh, questions about the, the, the Global Methane Pledge. Um, is, are the pledges that we've received so far uh, sufficient to contribute or are on, are in line with our scenarios. Thanks, Tom, and, and thanks to ask the, ask the question. As we heard from, from Dr. Birol, the Global Methane Pledge is a very positive step forward. Um, just to put the numbers on it, it talks about a 30% reduction in all sources of methane. 
So that's from oil and gas, from coal mining, from agriculture, from waste, everything, put it all together, a 30% reduction in all of those sources of emissions. And there's around about 100 countries that have signed up to that pledge. Now, it's much easier to reduce some sources of methane emissions than others. Um, we have done a lot of work in the past on reducing methane emissions from oil and gas and from fossil fuel operations. And one of the, the, the cornerstones of the Net Zero report that we put out was a 75% reduction in methane emissions from, from fossil fuel operations. So from oil and gas and from coal. So the 30% is for all sources. The 75% is for oil, gas, and coal. If the world was to achieve what we set out in terms of that 75% reduction, it would go a very, very long way to achieving that overall 30% reduction. It would get you pretty much all of, all of that way. There would still need to be some work on agriculture and on waste. They're much more challenging. They're likely much more challenging than it is to tackle emissions from fossil fuel operations, but it would be a very good start. So we would like to see that as part of that Global Methane Pledge that action on fossil fuel operations is front and center of countries' efforts to achieving that. Please. Thank you very much. Um, Ed Gemmel, Managing Director, Scientist Warning Europe. I don't think you really answered the question there, and I'd be pleased to hear, hear if you actually really do think that the pledges to reduce on methane are enough to save us on the planet. Um, from a Scientist Warning Europe point of view, and a, a letter we issued by 28 top scientists, including James Hansen and Sir David King, only a week ago, suggests that 2030 net zero is the only target, or as near as possible, and the current methane um, commitments are wildly off what's needed to keep the planet from going over 1.5 degrees or even two. I think we need to distinguish a little bit between what we mean by, by net zero. So first of all, methane and CO2 are not, are not the same. We have to get to net zero CO2 as quickly as possible. And it's until we get to net zero CO2, the temperature rise will keep increasing. One of the reasons we put the emphasis on methane and why the, the pledge is a very positive step forward is because it is such a powerful impact in the short term. So if we can have an immediate reduction in methane emissions, that will, that will reduce the temperature or prevent, prevent a larger increase um, in a very short period of time. So some of the numbers that you see out there is that if we achieve the Global Methane Pledge, that will shave about 0.2 degrees off the temperature rise. Now, that doesn't mean that you can do methane instead of CO2. You have to do both of them together. You have to get CO2 down to zero and alongside that, you have to get methane coming down. Now, 30% by 2030 is, is a great step forward. We need to have more than that. Um, but it, it's unlikely that we're going to be able to get methane down to zero entirely. Um, at the minute, we don't have the technical options available to us. We can't get agriculture to be zero emissions. So what we need to see is to get that methane down as quickly as possible. That will have an immediate impact on reducing the temperature rise, while in tandem we have this, this overall reduction in CO2 emissions. And as we said out in our net zero report, if we have net zero CO2 globally by 2050, that is in line with the, with the 1.5 degrees. Okay, thank you very much. I'd like to come back to the, ah, we have another question here before moving on. Um, how, how is the methane reduction calculated? Is it if you burn the methane, then you would emit more CO2? Is it taken into account uh, to, calc to compute the 70% uh, reduction for the oil and gas industry? So the 75% reduction for the oil and gas industry is avoiding that methane being leaked into the atmosphere. Now, some of the vast majority of that has to be from just avoiding those leaks happening. So for example, we have gas pipelines and they leak and we need to stop those leaks from happening. Um, similarly, at an extraction facility, sometimes tanks are there and they leak, and we stop those leaks from happening. Um, so the vast majority of that 75% has to come about from just avoiding those leaks. And in fact, one of the things that we show is that a large proportion of those 75% reductions can be achieved at no net cost. Effectively, methane is very valuable, and if you stop it from being leaked, you will be able to sell that gas and therefore actually pays for itself. In some cases, if, you, if there are no other options available to, to you, you, you might choose to burn that natural gas rather than, than uh, uh, letting it vent to the atmosphere. But the key thing is to stop it getting to the atmosphere and to make sure that it's used in a much more productive way. Okay, thank you. I'd like to come back for one last question to uh, Lord Devon's example 
of the, the, the new fossil fuel plant and, and whether we should be exploiting these or not. On the one hand, the IEA said no need for new such investment, but we also said we should be making the dirty energy cleaner. And there's a, the question is, have we created a loophole here for ongoing fossil fuel exploitation? But we have an answer. Thank you, Tom. So just to clarify on what the net zero roadmap says, it says if we have those policies in place for, to achieve 1.5 degrees, we will have a huge surge in investment into clean energy technologies. If we have that surge in investment, we will have a reduction in fossil fuel demand and therefore, and it's possible to reach that projection for fossil fuel demand without any investment into new fields. So that's where we came up with this conclusion that there is no need for new oil and gas fields or new coal mines or mine extensions if we have those policies put in place. But when I talked about that surge that we requ re require in investment, we need to go from about $1 trillion over the past five years or so up to $3 trillion. And we need to do that in the next eight years. So they were talking about a $2 trillion gap which we need to fill. A large proportion of that is going to go into unequivocally clean things like wind and, and solar. But there's also a bit of a, a gray area as, as, the, as the question mentioned. There's a bit of, there's some investments which we need to make which don't immediately deliver net zero. So these are things like electric cars are absolutely better than internal combustion engine cars, but unless you have zero carbon electricity, you, you don't deliver net zero. So those are what we call contingent investments. So you need to make the investment into electric cars, but don't expect it to deliver net zero immediately. We need something else to happen for that to, happen, to, to get to net zero. So there is this kind of middle area. There's also some things we call transition investments. This is things like efficiency improving the efficiency of existing buildings. Very, very important for moderating energy use, very important for reducing overall emissions, but by itself, it's not going to deliver net zero. So it's very, it would be very nice if we could just separate the whole investments that are needed into unequivocally green and unequivocally dirty. But actually, there's a big area in the middle. And what we estimate is around about half of the investment, half of that $3 trillion we're talking about, is into this tricky area of how do we, how do we really get technologies coming through which are good, but they're not yet at net zero. And we would like to see much more emphasis put on to how we, how we finance and bring about those overall investments. Great, thank you very much. I think they, we have time for one last question, so please. One for Lord Debert, if I may. Um, the, uh, of course, Dr. Birol said earlier, that, correct me if I got this wrong, but we, we seem to be heading for 1.8 degrees. Based, based on what's, uh, what's being said here at the conference. Um, I, wondered, yeah, I was wondering your take on that as well. Is that something you agree with on the CCC? I'm not sure that I quite got what the question was, but if you'll shout it out, that would be very much more helpful. Yes. Yes. Well, well, yes, are we on track for 1.8 degrees, which is, I mean, what I'm always fascinated is about, about how many different people have a different route as to what we're on track for. <laughs> um, and uh, and I, I therefore am not going to put my, uh, my own extra one. I'll just say this. I think that the uh, suggestion that uh, the figuring, which came from uh, the United Nations figures, which got us out to somewhere like 2.7, actually misses out a great deal of good news, so that I would certainly be bringing it down towards uh, uh, two from them looking at their own figures. I think it's something much closer to 2.2. I'm very worried about using things that's further down than that because it seems to me that you've actually got to get people to have their feet to the fire. And all these figures, when you get down below that, demand what we call um, the tailwind set scenario. In other words, everything works together in the right direction. But they don't. Um, and we know that in our own lives. If we run our own family budgets on the basis that all the good things will turn up and there'll be no extra bills, then you never get... You, you never get out of the red. And I just think we have to go for the fact that we're, 
we're doing well enough not to be so disheartened that we should eat, drink and be merry because tomorrow we die. We're doing much better than I, I, I always say to myself, look back 10 years and think, would you have believed that we could have got where we've got now 10 years ago? And the answer is no. I think we've done enormously better than I would have thought. But having said that, I don't think we should, I think we should be saying to ourselves that unless we really do get what we need, we are, we are certainly moving for something above two degrees. And that's why what happens here is crucial. And more importantly, that people actually do do what they say they are going to do. And methane in agriculture is going to be one of our biggest issues. There's a whole range of things we've got to do. And I want us all to spend our time doing them and delivering them. And just come back to my first comment, which is that we have to be optimistic. But we also uh, have to recognize the apocalypse, which is just around the corner. Thank you very much. I'd echo the fact that I, th I think that's quite consistent with where your message is, because uh, Dr. Baderol this morning was talking of the pledges, uh, and the pledges coming down to a projected 1.8 degrees a scenario. But the World Energy Outlook is, is full of the narrative of the gap between the pledges and the implementation. And that's exactly what you've been talking about, Lord Lemon, that, uh, that whether we talk of putting the feet to the fire or, or whether we provide, as the IEA does, provide advice on how to actually take the steps you need to, uh, to take to implement and reduce emissions. The story that uh, the minister from Colombia was, was telling us of and in, in what's happening in Colombia, that's, that's how we fill the gap. And that's how we do move away from, uh, from oblivion. On that optimistic note, <laughs> I thank you all for joining this morning. I thank very much the Minister and Lord Deben for their, their interventions. And uh, please go away with today's headline and, uh, and optimism. Thank you very much for joining us today.